right? We'll try our best. All right, so tell us about yourself for those that have been living under a rock. Oh, well, I don't even know what's living under a rock. Uh, so I'm Brendan Burns. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Kubernetes Open Source Project. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. It, it's basically a way of taking a whole bunch of computers and joining them together into a single shared resource and then using those resources to deploy a wide variety of containers and put together uh, what has been come to known as cloud native applications. So, uh, and then I, I work uh, for Azure, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, in addition to the Azure Kubernetes service you just heard about with Scott, um, uh, I work on actually, I, I run a bunch of other teams that deal with sort of DevOps and APIs in Got general it. and open source, a lot of open source on Azure. So I know there's a lot of devs that have heard about Kubernetes and, and maybe I'm in this camp where I need to know a little bit more. How did you come up with that name? Or how did that name even come up? Well, Kubernetes, I mean, it sounds like, like a future thing. It, it wasn't me. Um, I, it was uh, one of my co-founders, uh, Craig McClucky. Uh -huh. um, and um, the, we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, the project was originally called Seven of Nine. Um, uh, because, so the original internal container orchestrator that, that we used was called Borg. Because it's like the Borg, <laughs> the, it's the Borg Collective. That seems uh, more apropos, I think. And so Seven of Nine, if you've ever watched Star Trek Voyager, which is a way of admitting that I watch too much Star Trek. Oh, my goodness. Um, Seven of Nine is like the Borg character in, in, in Star Trek Voyager. And so I originally called it Seven of Nine as the code name. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became Project Seven, uh, or as these names iterate, these code mm -hmm. names iterate. But then we went, we had to launch, and we needed a launch name. Um, and we were thinking a lot, Craig actually was thinking a lot about, well, we were all sort of batting words back and forth, but Craig was, was driving to work, uh, as he tells it. And um, he was thinking, well, what does it do? And, and Docker sort of had all of these sort of nautical you know, like yeah. they had the whale, and they had yeah. sort of like, so there's a lot of sort of marine analogies going on. So he's like, well, it's like the person who drives the ship. Kubernetes is like the person who drives the ship. And so he looked up helmsman, uh, the word helmsman in uh, Greek. And it, uh, and Kubernetes is, is Greek for us. I, I, we actually pronounce it wrong. It's some, I think if you're actually Greek, you pronounce it something like Kubernetes or something like that. But it's too late. Everyone's uh, been saying it wrong. Yeah, it's everyone's, too late. It's, it's our fault. Um, uh, so that's, and it stuck, and, and, and we launched from there. And uh, it turns out, in retrospect, um, it's actually also the root of cyber and cybernetics. So the word cyber actually comes from, from Kuber in really? Greek. And it totally looks like we planned it, and we totally didn't. No, we, well, we're going to delete this in post, <laughs> yeah, because they, you totally planned it. We totally it. planned it, yeah. So yeah. With, the, with the advent of this new kind of technology recently, there's a lot of terms floating around. I'm hoping, because this is Kubernetes for the clueless. Sure. There is like, we have Kubernetes, we have images, we have containers, we have Docker. Can you make sense of that for us? I mean, help, help us out. Yeah, I mean, so I thought maybe we would... Um, uh, do a little whiteboarding. Let's do if it. That, if that works. Yeah, so, let's do it. Let's uh, go to the screen let's here. Let's go to the screen here. Hopefully this will show up. Um, so, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll turn it a little bit so you can see there, but hopefully we're, we're, we're broadcasting this out to everybody. So Are you on a Surface or, Go right here? I am on a Surface Go. And you're doing like a distributed computing talk here on a Surface Go. I love my Surface Go. Man, this I is totally, amazing. I totally love it. This is amazing. Um, I, I walk to work a lot. And okay. so like the fact that it's a pound and a half is just... It's life changing. All right. Um, all right. So you know, when when we're talking about uh, a container, there's actually sort of two parts of the container. There's the um, there's the image. Mm -hmm. I wish I had my pen. Um, and then there's the kernel. Um, uh, I should just not spell words. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I should just Beautiful. not spell word. No, um, this is okay. I love but, it. But the the so the image is actually what a lot of people are thinking about because you know when you when you used to build things on a VM, if you had a VM here, you have like you know your app here maybe and some shared library, and maybe mm -hmm. you have a couple of different apps, and they both depend on the same shared library. Um, and now you're in this, this sort of thing that people call DLL hell mm -hmm. or dependency hell, right. where it's hard to upgrade one application um, because it, two applications depend on the same thing, and you make a little change, and it has all these downstream effects that, that break things. And so people got into containers a lot because they were really interested in separating the images so that you could have you know, multiple different images, and they ran on the same kernel, um, but all of the dependencies are up here in the image. All of the things that you need, so these images become very hermetically sealed. Mm -hmm. And so they, you can upgrade each one independently. They never interfere with each other. Um, 
And they're also isolated from a resource perspective. So um, in terms of RAM and in terms of memory, they have totally separate uh, sets of, of resources that they're using. And so they, they are isolated in a way that makes them, them easy to use. Um, so that was sort of what got people into containers originally. Okay. Because if you think back to the, to the days of VMs, it was really hard to manage. You ran all these scripts, right. they failed. Like, in, and after it failed once, could you run it again? Maybe if right. you built the script right. It's very hard to understand why it broke, how it broke. Whereas with a container image, it, it was item potent. You just, if it didn't work, you just installed it again. Right. If you upgraded, you didn't worry about stuff left over from a previous version messing mm -hmm. around with stuff. Um, so that's really why people started getting into it. But again, this, this boundary here, this is all just one machine. Right, like it's all just running on one machine, and right. so. But most systems, when you're building these distributed applications, they need to be on multiple machines. Right, um, and so that's where an orchestrator. So I'll erase here. Let me pause you there sure. for a second because one of the one of the things that sometimes I conflate or get confused with is the notion of an image versus a container. Is it the sure. same thing, or what's the difference? Well, container is this word that's gotten kind of overloaded. So help right? me out. Maybe you can um, demystify it. Sure. Maybe I will, maybe I will I'll, I'll, I'll try and draw a different picture here. So um, there's sort of two different pieces. There is oh, there's the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, it's very cloudy. Very it's very cloudy. I'm going to try and draw a laptop here. There's my laptop. Holy cow. I know. It's not bad, right? The degree in art. That's right. I'm not even kidding. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And um, you got into distributed systems from it art? It was computer science and art. I have a double major in Dang. computer science and art. Um, uh, so anyway, you, you, you do a bunch of work on your laptop, and you build up a container image. And you can think of a container image really as basically just being like a, an archive. Okay. It's really just a bunch of bits, binaries, files, all kind of smooshed together, mm -hmm. right? So you have that image here. And so um, image is the same as container? Well, it's a container image. Okay. So I think it's, I guess maybe the right way to say this is it's like a class versus an instance. Okay. Okay. Right? So like the image is the class. The that makes container, sense. the running container is the instance. Okay. Right? And so you, you take the image, you push it up into the cloud, into the registry, um, and then on a bunch of different servers, you can run that same image. And then they're running on the kernel. And so you have a bunch of, if this is your class, you have a bunch of instances running, running on different machines. And in this case, um, an instance might be a whole software stack, for example, of, for running a service. Right. And the, and the reason they're called containers is that um, you know, effectively, if you, inside of the kernel, um, so like the kernel has things like, uh, like a, the easiest thing to think about is like the process ID space, PID mm -hmm. space. So every process that runs has a number associated mm -hmm. with it. Typically, on a, on a normal machine, there's only one of those. Yeah. Right? There's only one process one, there's only one process two, there's only one process three. With a, with a running container, you actually create a separate P PID namespace for each container. And so there's actually a, PID, there's a process one in each of those. I see. And they can't see each other, and so that's why they're sort of that's the the running container part is I this see. like isolation inside of the kernel that's cool. uh, to keep the applications apart. From and each you keep other. talking about kernel, that basically means the OS, the operating system. Well, you have to be very specific. Okay. It actually means kernel. Okay. Right. Um, operating system is also a vague word. <laughs> it turns <laughs> out um, because like an operating system is the combination of the kernel and the user space. Got it. So like, um, you know, uh, you look at like an Ubuntu, it's going to ship a kernel. It also ships things like Bash. Right. So the Bash isn't in the kernel. Got it's it. an application that uses the kernel. Um, or, you know, there's, so there's a, so with a container, all of the user space stuff, all Bash and all that kind of stuff, it's in the container image. I see. But the logic that implements, like, accessing a file or accessing a kernel. disk, that's in the kernel. Cool. And, it, and what's important, actually, is that that logic in the kernel is shared between multiple containers. I see. And, and that's actually important because it means that the containers themselves are actually not secure, mm -hmm. right? Because they share that kernel. If there's an exploit in the kernel, I can jump out of my container and into your container. I see, with like Which a fun, funky system call. With a bad memory, system yeah. call or you know, whatever, right? And so that's, it's really important for people to understand that containers are there to sort of keep us from stepping on each other. Mm -hmm. But they're not there. Like if you're malicious and you're mean, I'm not letting you, I'm not letting you run a container next to, next to me. I see. So it looks like when you're running a container, 
it thinks it's, you know, because like every process when it's running, it thinks I'm the only one running because yeah. I'm the best one. And then exactly. you swap it out and it, it's suspended. And same thing same with Same idea, the, but, but applied to the file system, applied to CPUs. So you can lock them. You have a multi-core CPU. You can lock containers to different cores. Mm -hmm. So you can say this container has exclusive access to this core. This container has exclusive access to that core. Okay. You know, the operating system normally would switch you back and forth, okay. but, but if you're locked, it won't. And it'll protect your resources that way. That's cool. So, so now that we understand that we're, we're making these logical things called containers that have functionality, that they think they're the only program running, then we need to start talking about uh, two things. And hopefully you can help me with this, because I sure. always have a hard time with this, is how small, because some people might put like their SQL server all the way to their ASP.NET application in a container, but that feels wrong. Yeah, yeah. And some people might put like a single function into a container, but that seems wrong as well. Yeah. How do you how do you know what granularity to use? Number one. And then the second question, which I think gets to Kubernetes, is how do you start to manage how these things live with each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So uh, I mean, in answer, I'm gonna. Uh... So in answer to the first question, I mean, in some ways, I said it's like a class in an instance. Mm -hmm. It is kind of like designing classes. Like you could almost say the same thing about objects right. in Java mm -hmm. or, or you know whatever. Like how do you design the right object? Um, but but there are guidelines, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so generally speaking, the container is a unit of scaling. Okay. Right. And so you talk about the you know your Java Tomcat server and your database. Well, if you put those in the same server. You can only create. You probably can only create one container instance, right? Right, because you're you don't want to create lots of copies of that database. Mm -hmm. You're only going to have one instance of that database. So now you're restricted. Your horizontal scaling of your web server is limited by the fact that you've placed it in the same container as your database, and you can't scale your database, mm -hmm. right? Um, so generally, you would say, you know, what I want to separate the web serving tier from the database because I want to have 10 copies of my web serving tier, but I might only have one or two copies of my database. Right. And one is a fallback right. and one is a primary. One is a fallback and a primary, and you know, if I'm living dangerously, maybe I just have one. Right. Um, and, and so that's, that's what you're thinking about. Yes. Right? It's, it's how, do I, wh how do I break things apart into horizontal scalability? I think the other thing to think about is the container image itself often becomes um, an artifact that is produced by a team. Okay. And so if you want to have if you want to decouple your teams, oftentimes you decouple them by having them produce oh. different container images. So it's not just a right? technical thing, it might be an organizational thing as well. Correct. And, and so you you sort of I mean the same thing with like object oriented programming and classes come in because you might want to have an interface that separates two teams. And I you see. might do that just just to to build better teams, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and I think in in general Kubernetes was trying to build these abstractions that allow you to decouple uh, your 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 different pieces from different pieces from one another. Awesome. Right? Well, I've heard the the saying in computer science goes that when you have a problem and then you solve it with distributed systems, now you have two problems. Ten problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ten problems. So, how does Kubernetes help with orchestrating? Because that that's what it is, an orchestrator. Right. Because some people and I confuse this, and maybe you did too at home. I confuse Kubernetes with like actual. Con making containers and being right. Docker, but it's not. No, it's it's not. not Docker. Not at all. So no, tell us about no, that. No, no. Well, I mean, Docker kind of straddles the line, but because um, it's both the builder and the run. And I think one of the reasons I have this trouble with container and container image is Docker is actually both the thing that builds the image and the thing that runs the image. Yeah. And that confuses people. Yeah. Um, no, so an orchestrator is really intended to provide um, uh, tooling around. So I, I, the container, I call it the runnable thingy. Mm -hmm. It's like you imagine you have this black box and you can press a play button on yeah. it. And it Plays, it runs. Right, and it runs. But there's all sorts of stuff like, what happens if it stops running? What should you do? How do you know it's healthy? What mm -hmm. if I want three copies of it? How do I bring load balance? How do I load balance traffic to it? All this kind of stuff. That's how. Uh, that's what Kubernetes provides. I see. Right, and and um, there's actually a series of, of examples that we could step through. Let's uh, do that. But you want to do that? Before right. we do that, though, there's a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, there's lots of chatter on serverless versus containers and what to use when. What do you suggest before we dive in? Um, well, so I think it's important to distinguish between uh, serverless, meaning I don't have any servers, yeah. versus functions as a service, which is a programming model. Right. Right. And I think they got kind of conflated. Yeah. Right? But we actually, in Azure, offer serverless containers. Right. Oh. So Azure Container Instances is serverless containers where you give us a container image, we run it for you. But it's like infrastructure as a service. Right. It's like you know, we just run it. It's like you gave us a disk, a VM image, and we ran a VM. But instead, you give us a container in image, and we run your container. I see. But it's not. We don't tell you how to program. We don't tell you what language. Like functions as a service, 
you know, there's only a certain number of programming languages you can use, mm -hmm. a certain amount of memory you can use. There are none of those restrictions in uh, our serverless container offering, right? I see. It, it's, inf it's IaaS. It just happens to be IaaS where you don't see a machine. I see. Right? And then there's functions as a service, which is a programming model, event-driven, on-demand. It's, a, oh, it's a way of, and, and tooling, you know, easy to use tooling makes it really easy for you to take a, a piece of code and push it up into the cloud. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish between those two things. Um, I think that I see functions as a service being really great for web hooks, for... The glue, the internet glue, glue yeah. Or like, hey, you know, something asynchronous happened on some queue, somebody uploaded a file, and mm -hmm. I want to do something in response to somebody uploading a file. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think... Containers are more oriented towards longer running processes or large scale serving where mm -hmm. you know you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of requests a second and right. you just need to have something that's running all the time. I see. Um, that's a place where, where containers are more useful. I think ultimately when we look at the apps of the future, what we're going to see is people are building with a mix of containers, functions as a service, um, and uh, um, uh, data stores like uh, Cosmos DB mm -hmm. and, and those sorts of things, right? So when we're talking about Azure Container Instances, that's what you're talking about, right. containers as a service. Yeah. But then that, it begs the question, if you have hundreds of those things that you're spinning up, right. how do you manage them together? And then now yeah. we can get into the and Kubernetes. That's, and that's Kubernetes. And in fact, actually, today we just announced the preview of um, uh, virtual nodes for Kubernetes, which basically takes that serverless container infrastructure and marries it up with Kubernetes uh, orchestration. So oh. you can actually orchestrate the serverless containers using the Kubernetes APIs. So you can either decide, do I want to deploy containers to VMs, or do I want to deploy containers to the serverless container infrastructure? Oh, that's amazing, because then you don't have to worry about, like, because usually, what, the first time I set up Kubernetes, and I did one time, and I, because I, I went through the tutorial, like some, all, right. all good people do, I had to set up VMs to do stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But with, with, with this, it's, there's no VMs. There's no VMs, it's all Azure service. It's all in Azure service, and there's no, you know, we do all the upgrading of, of the OS. We manage the OS for you. Um, if a machine fails, you it just moves over to a different machine, all that stuff. Can I yeah. choose, like, a machine that has a GPU on it yet? Uh, we have GPU in Azure Container Instances, not in the virtual nodes currently. Okay, But, cool. yeah, it's coming. It's all right, coming. let's take a look. All right, cool. Um, so I have a simple uh, little YAML file here. So when, one thing you'll see, actually, um, is... Uh, Kubernetes loves its YAML. Um, mm -hmm. So when I when I see here, I'm describing the containers that uh, I'm going to run. Um, and so this, this is the file. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Just so I want to understand. This is the file that says here are all the images that I want to run in this pod. application. It, well, in this pod, which is one uh, one sort of atomic scheduled thing, one one replica of your application. Okay. So this is only just running a single instance, not running multiple instances. There are other primitives for creating replicated things. Three, I four, see. five, six, seven. Okay. We'll talk about those in just a second. Cool. Let's do that. All right. So but first we're going to create this pod. So we're going to say kube control create dash f. Uh, and what this is doing is this is getting all of those image definitions and getting them ready to run as containers. Together. It's actually, yeah, it's, it's actually making a declarative state a declarative statement to the cluster saying, please run this. Okay. I want this to exist. Okay. Right? And so then, having done that, if we say kube control get pods, um, you can see that we have this, this one up and running. It's been running for 17 seconds. So this basically, when you create it, it's, it's getting all of those images, creating containers, Downloads running them. it. Yeah. Okay. And Runs it on it. the orchestrator. And, and then the pod represents like a logical unit of containers together. Yes. Yeah. And, and the reason it's, it's multiple containers is you might have an application container, and then you might have a container that's doing something like log forwarding. Mm -hmm. So it's reading the logs off the application, shipping them to Azure monitoring or something okay. like that. Cool. Um, so then Kubernetes actually has a lot of tools for uh, sort of debugability, mm -hmm. uh, including the ability to port forward. So that server is running. It's not on the internet, but it's running on port 8080. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if we go back over here. You can actually see, you can see its IP address. So there's its IP address, um, which is inside the cluster. I see. Uh, but then I can actually port forward it, which means that um, I'm going to port forward traffic from my local machine here out into the cluster so that I can play around in my application without it being exposed to the internet. Okay. But I can do development. I can push it up. I can run it, test it, 
without it being exposed to the internet. That's cool. And while that's going, just a quick question, because I I've done I've been able to do like Docker Run and be able to port forward, right? You know, so I could expose it. This is more like Docker Run, but with multiple images. And well, no, but more importantly, connected to the cloud. Okay. This this container is executing in an Azure data center. Oh my goodness. And so the port forwarding is bringing the network from the Azure data center down to the local machine here. Holy cow, that's amazing. So this is a little, this is the uh, QR demo, which is the Kubernetes up and running book that I wrote mm -hmm. um, with uh, Kelsey Hightower and, mm -hmm. and Joe Beto, who's one of the founders. It's kind of a way of like exploring some of the features of Kubernetes. Right. Um, and in particular, we can go over here and take a look at this liveness probe. So. Um, one of the ways that Kubernetes makes it easier to run these distributed systems is it will automatically restart your application if it fails, right? Oh, cool. And not just if it crashes, but actually if you define it as being unhealthy. And the way you define it as being unhealthy is you can say, hey, please hit this web endpoint. If I return 200, I'm healthy. If I don't return 200 or I don't return anything, I'm unhealthy, and I want you to terminate me. Right, and because that's good, because maybe you get deadlocked, or you get mm -hmm. overloaded, or something bad happens. You know, your something bad happens. Your process is still running, but you're not successfully processing web requests. And you won't get like some beeper in the middle of the night. Right, to and so you won't, you won't, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to get a page and all sorts. Mm -hmm. You want the automation. The, the one way to think about this is, you know, there's planes out there that fly by wire, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just literally fly them, and then there's things like, uh, you know, like the B2 stealth. There's a computer there. Yeah. The only way that thing stays in the air is because there's a computer driving it. Right. Kubernetes is the same way, right? right. Like there's a there's a computer that's trying to keep your application healthy for you. Um, so we can actually drop back over here, um, and I will terminate this one. Um, I'm going to delete the instance that I have. And this is running in the cloud. I mean, how this did is, you yeah, how this did you running map this all? There's like, do you have to like do something with Cube CTL in order to uh, so when you create the cluster, you download this configuration file, okay. and the configuration file gives you like the certificates and Got it. Ac for accessing it. Okay. Actually, I use AAD um, mm -hmm. for accessing it and the IP address and all that stuff. And then okay. once it's done, it's it's but it's through AZ. You just say the the AZ tool. You just say AZ get credentials, and boom, it's on your file system. You're ready to go. Love it. Um, so then, if we go over here to this health check one, um, what you'll see here is this looks similar, except for I've added this uh, liveness probe, right? And so what Liveness Probe says is, I want you to hit this URL on my container to see if you're healthy or not, right? And it's going to probe it every three seconds. So you can see the period seconds is every three seconds. So every three seconds, Kubernetes is going to hit this endpoint. Holy cow, that's see if amazing. You're, see if you're healthy. So we can run this one. So like if you're, if you're making a Flask app, for example, you just have an extra function there ready and be like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah and, I'm and good. you can do stuff. I mean, you can do more advanced stuff. You can check to see if you can talk to the database. Maybe, oh, that's true. maybe like you know, you have a connection pool, and the connection to the database has screwed up somehow. Mm -hmm. And if you can't connect to the database, well, you can serve web requests, but you're not really healthy. Yeah. You'd prefer that it terminates you, and you come back up, and maybe you reconnect successfully when you when you terminate. Right. So, so you healthiness is a defined. Healthiness by the is is application defined by yeah. the programmer, cool. right? Um, and so just like we did before, we can do Q control create chef. Uh, so we're going to create this, but now we're going to have this health check. Um, and if we reactivate the port forwarding, um, and we go back over to here, I'm going to reload, um, go to the liveness probe. And what you're going to see here is it, it's, you can see the health probes happening. That's cool. Right? It's every three seconds. You, know, four, you can see that it's three sec there's a three second interval. Now what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to set it to fail. So I'm going to set the health check to return 500 right. permanently. So we'll say it's permanently failing. You're going to see a 500 in there. Um, and now what you're going to see, um, when if we go back over to the terminal, is so if you saw here, there's zero restarts. Yeah. Now if I do a cube control, there's going to be a restart pause, every three seconds. There's actually it's, it's only once because it's in memory. Oh, I see. The fail always is an in memory setting. Got it. So it fails once, but then it comes back, and I haven't clicked fail again, so oh, so it's healthy so, now. Okay. Cool. Right. So it's got one restart, um, and so you can see there like. Obviously, it's a contrived example with me setting fail, but if you had a real application health That's check there, really cool. it fails, Kubernetes creates it automatically. All right, let's, right? let's burn through some of these questions because yeah, people have sure. some questions while going. Any plans on using Firecracker for better container isolation, or does MS contribute? I don't know what Firecracker is. Maybe you, you don't know, know what Firecracker is? No. Oh, Firecracker is interesting. It's a, so AWS recently announced uh, it's an open source, very thin container optimized uh, virtual machine. Okay. It's actually very similar, almost identical really, to Hyper-V containers. Okay. So we've actually had Hyper-V containers for 
you know, a couple of years at this point. Very similar idea. Mm -hmm. Take because, as I said earlier, containers aren't a security boundary. Right, of course. But the hypervisor is, and so you, what you can do is you can take a hypervisor, a really optimized kernel, very, very stripped down, very small, um, and so you can boot up something that looks and feels like a container, but is actually more like a really, really thin virtual machine. So it's secure. Um, yeah. And so actually, there's a number of projects here. Uh, Kata containers by Intel is another one. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually run, so you can integrate Kubernetes with these runtimes. So you, with actually right now on, uh, on Azure, you can run, using nested virtualization, you can run Kata containers and Kubernetes to have secure containers. Cool. Um, and actually, you know, Hyper-V containers is, is the infrastructure that uh, we can use for something like ACI. So, so I, I think it's really great to see this kind of innovation happening in open source. It's great to see uh, people thinking about this. Um, I'm sure that we'll all collaborate on a single container runtime at some point. Um, yeah. So that's 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 the way we the work about it. Great question. Next one. I don't know Kubernetes containers. Let's say I develop web APIs to connect with our mobile apps. What could be a reason to learn Kubernetes and implement it instead of keeping using what I know and just host the API in a normal web service? Uh, I would say if you're happy with what you're doing, you should stick with it. And that's it, right? Like I like, think this is important, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. We, there are new things come out, and we're like, oh, we need to spend money doing the new thing. Yeah. When at what point will this thing that he's or she's doing be like? You should probably consider now using Kubernetes. Like, well, like I mean, what are the smells? Yeah. So I mean, I think if you're worried about agility, like you feel like you can't push code fast enough, or like rolling out your software is a scary experience. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've talked to teams where it was like. Yeah, we do a rollout once a month, and everybody's on call for the 48-hour period. Oh, my god! And gosh. it's this, like, 10-page long checklist of, like, step-by-step step of how I roll out the software. And you, it's like you're burning the bridge behind you. Like, you can't walk back. <laughs> like, you're, like, step-by-step. <laughs> no. um, if you find yourself in that mode, if you're scared of deploying software, that's probably a good indication that, like, you maybe should think about some of this stuff. Um, if you run into outage problems where you log onto a machine, you make some fix, it restores itself, but then... You know, you forget what you did to fix things. Yes. You know, and you're developing these machines that that are snowflakes. Mm -hmm. Like that's a good indication that maybe you should. But something like app services, app services is already kind of immutable and and has a lot. So if if you're if, if you're content with the limitations of app services, that's great, fantastic. Stay with it, right? I think Kubernetes will help you relative to app services would help you build, you know, some sort of more multi-layer applications or take advantage of the open source ecosystem a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, but like. Yeah, I, I would do it because there's pain. If you think that it will help with pain, rather than like, oh, well, we should do this. Like, we want to be buzzword compliant. You don't. You don't want to make pain for yourself. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to alleviate yeah, pain. Yeah, yeah. And if it does it, then you should do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So we just did health check. What was the next thing you were going to show us? All right. So I'm going to show you uh, a little bit about load balancing. Um, so, um, so when you're when you're load balancing traffic into uh, Kubernetes, it's this thing called a service. Um, and if we take a look here, there's a service. Um, uh, the, the basic idea is this defines a load balancer that's going to target a bunch of containers. And the way that it targets it is um, this selector. My app is demo. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and if you looked at that, uh, the pod definition that we had before, it has, uh, where is it? The label. It has a label right here that says app is demo. So it's like tags. So you tag a container, okay. and then the load balancer looks for things with that tag, and it brings traffic to those to those uh, to those, those pods. Okay. Um, and so we can actually go and uh, do. I'm going to actually. I'm going to delete because I'm going to. We're going to so, delete the one that we have because I'm actually adding a readiness check. I'll talk about readiness checks in just a second. Um, you were saying. Yeah. So as this is loading, uh, I noticed that in your YAML file, are you defining like? Because I'm looking at your code, there's no code there at all. There's yeah, just yeah, YAML yeah. files. Yeah. Where is the actual? Where are the actual containers coming from? Well, that's the image. So the image I built separately. Okay. I pushed it separately. So the image repository becomes sort of an abstraction point between the build process and the deploy process. I see. So you do a lot of work to build your image. You test it. You qualify it. You push it into a registry, and then you deploy it using the YAML config. So you really have separated the act of building from the act of deploying. And that's cool because then, for example, if there's a failure, a healthiness, a health check comes back as bad, it can roll back to a previous container if you tell it to do you it. You can definitely do that. Um, and hopefully, we actually have a demo of that, too. And oh, let's do we it. Can, um, so I want to show you the services first. Um, so we can say kube control create 
we'll create this container. And what's important in the container actually is in addition to this liveness probe that we saw before, there's now this readiness probe. And the idea behind a readiness probe is it tells whether or not the thing's ready to be part of a load balancer or not. Right? Oh, so I see. one tells you I want to be restarted. The other says, hey, I'm not ready to serve. Maybe I'm loading a big database file. Right. Maybe I'm you know, still initializing and booting up. Mm -hmm. I want you to keep me alive, but mm -hmm. I want you to uh, not bring me any traffic. Cool. Right? Um, and so now if we can create that service. Um, and when you create a, oh, it already exists. So I must have left over from when I tested to make sure the demos were working. And while um, you're typing this, this is actually really cool because I recently deployed to Kubernetes. I don't know, someone helped me. Lena, my, one of my coworkers helped me deploy. We have a machine learning model that's using GPUs that we need to deploy. And having a readiness check is actually super useful because I'm loading a pretty big yeah, machine yeah, yeah. learning model. Exactly. And so I got I to gotta put this in. Yeah, to the exactly. Service. So you see this, this, this service here, it's got an IP address associated with it. This mm -hmm. IP address is different than any of the containers. So when you target that IP address, you get load balanced out to the containers. That's cool. Right. Um, and actually, if you go back over to uh, our uh, app here, we can actually see in the DNS query, here, oh, I have to, probably have to restart port forwarding because I restarted the container. Start the port forwarding. Um, if we go over here, I can actually say demo service and do a DNS query. And what you see here is that there's a DNS entry for that IP address. So in addition to creating a service to be the load balancer, Kubernetes has also programmed DNS for the containers so that when I refer to demo service, when I say like connect to demo service, it's going to use DNS to look up the IP address and connect. So I can actually use my services names in my code to connect my various layers of my services oh, that's together. That's cool, and and that's just internal inside, inside the pod. inside the cluster, inside the yeah, and inside the contain all containers in the cluster. I see. So you might have multiple pods that represent logical units of your application. Yeah, they're grouped by services, mm -hmm. load balancer, given a DNS name, and so like my front end connects to back end. It doesn't connect to a specific pod. It connects to the back end service, mm -hmm. and the traffic is load balanced to to all of the all of the containers there. That's really right. Cool. And so actually, I can say we can go back over here. And I can uh, take a look at the endpoints. You can say cube control. It'll say watch. Is it cube cuddle or cube, cube control? Uh, or cube, cube control, CTL? cube CTL. Some people say cube cuddle. I don't. You heard it here first, folks. No, 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 no. <laughs> Plenty of people, reasonable people will disagree. OK. Um, oops, cancel. And so there's the endpoints for my service, right? That's that's the container that I would that it'll load balance traffic to. I only have one replica for right now, right, but right. you could have multiple replicas. Um, but what I was going to show you is if I go over here and I go to the readiness probe, um, and you can see the probe coming through. I'm going to set it to fail, so it's permanently failing. It's going to throw 500s. If we go back over here, what you're going to see is in uh, a little bit of time, it's actually going to get removed from the load balancer. So it got removed from the load balancer. So now I don't have any, which is bad, which is why I need replicas. Right. But like that entry got removed from the load balancer because it's failing its readiness check. Right? Um, wow. And so I, if I go back over and I say, OK, let's succeed instead. Let's go back to succeeding. So now it's going to start returning 200s, hopefully. Yeah, so now it's starting to return 200s. We go back over here. It's got it got added back into the load balancer, right? So that shows you that dynamically you can remove and add different endpoints from the load balancer, whether or not they're healthy or not. So you can ensure that you can do things like a zero downtime rolling upgrade uh, of the service. So I can go from version one to version two with user traffic coming at me with no downtime. Right. That's really cool, right? Because like my service started failing recently, and now I can go in there and actually respond with, hey, this is not healthy. Right. Restart me. Right. And uh, we can actually give, I actually have an example. Let's of, do it. Do you have, uh, yeah. yeah, let's do, you it, let's go do it. it. Yeah, I do. All right, so this is a, a little bit more of an involved example. Um, I'm actually going to hide, just have more screen real estate. Um, uh, this is going to do, use a deployment. And a deployment is a way of replicating containers mm -hmm. and also rolling out from one version of a container to another version of a container. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's do it. All right, so here we go. So we're going to take a look at that service. When we were talking about services before, so here's the service for my deployment. Um, I'm going to create that service. Um, and then I'm going to deploy the deployment with v1 of my app. And so one of the things you'll see here is there's five replicas of mm -hmm. this application. The version is v1. It's a really simple app, actually. All it is doing, basically, is it's 
catting v1 into this index.html, and then there's nginx serving that file. That's okay. Really simple. Cool. Um, all right, so we're going to deploy that. Um, How are you getting it to type all that stuff? It's like super uh, mojo. This is, yeah, so this is a, we, we have this demo script that was built, because um, whenever you do demos, you always make typos. Yeah, always. no, I know. Always, I, it's right? true. So, so it's really nice to have it be scripted. It's still live. It's still doing all the yeah. stuff live, but it's scripted and it runs it through a, a little tool that that makes it look like it's typed. So I use it for all, mm -hmm. I use it for a lot of my demos. What's it's, the tool called? Is it called auto? It's actually no. It's like we just it's hacked together with a bunch of little like Unix tools. It's a combination nice. of. Uh, it's this thing called PV, which is a Unix command line extension. Sorry, sorry for the little. No, no, no. It's, like it's demo totally or cool. To demo it's or totally like cool. Really... No, it's it's. It, I love it. Um, I always feel a little bit bad because I have people come up to me afterwards. Sometimes they're like, "Wow, you type really fast." And I'm like, "I have to admit to you that yeah. like, it, it was typed for me." Cool. Um, all right, so we created that demo with five replicas, and now we're using uh, this is Tmux to to do everything together. So you can see here, I have v1. I've got. I design, I want five to be there, and I want and I have five up and running. Mm -hmm. All right, and what you're going to see in this middle window here is it's hitting that, and you can see that the host names are changing, which shows you it's going to all of those different replicas, mm -hmm. and it's getting v1 back. All right, so let's actually upgrade to v2. So I'm replacing the little one-liner yeah. one -liner to replace v1 with v2. Man, we, we set an awk. I, I know, you can do it all, right? You can do everything. You can do everything. So what you can see here, though, is like my v2 is starting to come up, right? And right. in here, you're going to see v2 and v1 mixing in, because now I'm in this, I'm in this mode where um, it's escape. Um, I'm in this mode where I'm rolling out from v1 to v2. Mm -hmm. So you see mostly v2 at this point. I've got four replicas of v2 running, only one replica of v1. Um, and pretty soon we're going to get to a place where, yeah, so I have five replicas of v2, no replicas of v1. So I just did a rollout from v1 in my application to v2 in my application. No downtime. Done. Minute, less than a minute, right? That's amazing. Um, so, but, you know, imagine I don't like it. V2 is not, yeah. not, where, yeah, not where it's at. No, 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 no. It's not where it's v1 at. Is... V1. So we're going to roll it back. So we just say Q control roll out undo. And now a roll a rollback is really just a roll out in reverse. And so what you're going to see here is now I've got V1, got desired V1. And this is going to start V2s are coming down. Four four replicas of V2, two replicas of V1. We're going to keep doing that. Now you're starting to see some V1s in the load that's going to my service. You're seeing V1s start to pop up. And Dang. you know, in another 15 seconds, we're going to have rolled back. So not only did we roll out with zero downtime, we rolled back with zero downtime, uh, all while I'm sitting here chatting with you. If you if you if you specify like, is there a way to specify like if there's an unhealthy check on a rollout? Yeah. Just go back. It'll yeah. So sort of... that well, it doesn't it doesn't do the rollback, um, but it pauses. Mm -hmm. So that health check that we talked about, mm -hmm. every time it creates a new replica, it waits for that replica to become healthy and ready. And you can actually set a period of time. Like, I want it to be healthy for 20 minutes, okay. right? Just because you know, you know from experience that it takes a while for problems to emerge, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so every time it goes, it creates a new replica. It will wait for that health check to go that long, and only then will it move on. And if That's the health cool. check fails, obviously, it's if it's if it's failing the readiness check, it's not going into the load balancer, right? Right. So you're not bringing any traffic to it. Mm -hmm. um, and if it fails the readiness check for too long, then the deployment is considered failed. And it aborts the deployment, and it you can then have monitoring or whatever to say, hey, something bad happened here, or even automatically say, oh, rollback. That's right? cool. You can detect it and then issue this rollback command if you want. Depends on sort of who you are and, and what you're building the application for. But I think it gives you an idea of like some of the power that's built into Kubernetes. That's uh, really cool. Like, look, traditionally this stuff back when I started programming was me basically rebooting a server. Yeah. And hoping for the best. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, no, we've come a long way, I think. And this is pretty amazing. Um, so for those that are new to this, where can they go to find this, this run through this demo themselves to make it work? Yeah, so, the, so these, these demos are going to go up on GitHub in my repository, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of really great material um, on the Azure Kubernetes uh, site uh, mm -hmm. on, on Azure.com, as well as, honestly, on the Kubernetes.io mm -hmm. uh, website. Um, has a lot of great material. Um, there's a great Kubernetes Slack channel that for the whole community, like the Damn. entire Kubernetes, like across the world, there's a thousand, two thousand people on it live, mm -hmm. not just subscribe to the channel, but like live at wow. any particular moment, That's impressive. Um, which is amazing. Um, KubeCon's coming up in Seattle. Um, oh shoot, when is that? Next week in Seattle. It's sold out, unfortunately. Oh, but seven, do you need me to pick up chairs or clean toilets or something? Yeah, it's oh. convention. It's at the convention center. Seventy-five hundred cool. people come to the convention center. That's it's, amazing. It's amazing. It's well, awesome. congratulations. This is yeah. amazing. We've really needed this in software development. I think. Yeah, it's, I think I hopefully hopefully it helps. I think there's more to go, but we'll keep keep working on it. Awesome.